Richard Vicarius, who's a, a man of many hats, like we like here at the Interactive Mind Center. He's currently a director of at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig for Human Behavior, Culture and Evolution. Yeah, some order. Yeah. Some order, yes. And a professor at UC Davis in Anthropology. And as uh, yeah, the students in uh, COXI know very well, he has been both working very intensely on figuring out social learning and culture in humans, but also since he's been working on anthropological data, which are amongst the most messy data ever, in trying to figure out how do we deal with the uncertainty that comes from this sort of data. And in that version, he has uh, actually written a fantastic handbook called uh, Statistical Rethinking, which help people thinking about their problems in a statistical fashion from a Bayesian perspective, uh, which is highly recommended. But he hasn't forgotten his anthropological <coughs> and actually even classics background. So what you see in the handbook is that statistic is also seen as a situated practice of getting to know the world. And that's what makes Richard's work the most interesting, trying to combine these two sides, the methods and the important content question and letting them leak into each other. And I'm really excited to see what you're gonna say today. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Right. Thank you all for coming. See this talk, I understand it's it's exam period. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the board <laughs> so uh, it's my pleasure to be here. This is a really interesting uh, group of people uh, uh, to talk to you about this topic in particular. Um, so I'm at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, which is uh, a holistic evolutionary anthropology institute uh, focused on understanding where people come from. Small problem. Right. <laughs> and uh, my department uh, uh, focuses on uh, the role of culture and behavior in human evolution. Um, so let me, let me step back and take a, a broad view of what that means for evolutionary anthropology. So this is an elephant embryo. Uh, 16 weeks old. Uh, I think it, it's a fascinating thing about animal and plant life that giant, robust adults uh, subject their offspring to being reduced to single cells. Right? It seems like a terrible idea. Right? So if you're an elephant, a uh, 30-year-old elephant, you're big, uh, uh, there aren't very many natural dangers other than people in your world, uh, why would you then choose to continue your lineage by reducing it to a single cell and then you grow? Uh, uh, we don't have an answer to that in evolutionary biology, but uh, we do know that development that results from this, the fact that in, every generation has to grow up again, generates a whole range of interesting constraints and possibilities uh, that define the cognitive and behavioral lifestyles of organisms. Uh, so for elephants, they grow very large, it can take 30 years for a male to reach adult size. That's a long juvenile period, right? It's waiting a long time for things to happen. Uh, uh, other organisms, uh, like this small dinosaur, uh, the starling, uh, share certain life history constraints that arise from the way they get about. So flight as a, as a lifestyle imposes constraints on how fast you have to grow up and how heavy you can get. And so starlings, like most birds, they have to grow up in a year. That's all you've got. Basically, often it's less than a year. And they need massive energy investments from their parents uh, and possibly their, their older siblings as well in order to do that. You must fledge in less than a year or you're dead. Why? Because and you have to be able to fly uh, to make a living. You just have to. And that's a constraint that means that their childhoods are truncated. Nevertheless, birds can live for 20 years. Starlings can easily live for 20 years if they do successfully fledge. Uh, very different from, say, your lives where you spend substantial proportions being a juvenile. Uh, so the possibilities for starlings are quite different from our possibilities, uh, but equally interesting. Uh, and <laughs> snakes, I think snakes are also interesting in lots of ways. People often overlook our cold-blooded relatives. Uh, so uh, this is not a cat, right? <laughs> this is a snake. Um, fascinating thing about snakes and other animals that can regulate their metabolism and slow it down is that when they get a windfall of food, like say an elephant, uh, they can make full use of it. They can digest the whole thing. They don't have to share it. They have neither need nor opportunity to share the windfall. Again, very different from all of us. If you were to come across a dead elephant, you probably could not ingest it all and take a nap. Right? <laughs> but that's what the snake does. As a consequence, 
uh, and this is what I'm going to flesh out in the talk, humans deal with surpluses differently. When we generate a surplus, that opens up other possibilities, social possibilities, that are different from those that the snake has. Um, and we are allowed to have, as primates, long juvenile periods, and we can do things for those juvenile periods that the starling can't do, because it just can't take the time to grow up. Um, and that's the part of the puzzle of human evolution, is why we have organisms like this, uh, where we spend long periods of our lives, up to a third of our life, uh, being small and vulnerable and underskilled, uh, but practicing, often in quite awkward and entertaining ways, adult productive skills. Um, that once we're adults, produce tremendous surpluses of energy, far more energy than we need to sustain ourselves, and we share that surplus with younger generations, and with our colleagues, uh, and create, well, we create societies, social societies, uh, with social insurance that fund the next generation and keep the cycle going. How we get from a life history like the other apes, where many of these features are absent, uh, uh, some are present but many are absent, uh, we don't know, and that's part of the puzzle to understand. And what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, if you will, a meta-analytic project which aims to measure, uh, quantify, some of the parts of the maintenance of this life history so that we can better fit models about the evolutionary origins of it. Um, so think about uh, part of what we do with this long term uh, juvenile period, of course, is we learn um, locally specific productive skills and bodies of knowledge uh, that help us thrive in particular places. That humans are successful not because we do the same thing in a really good way every place, but because we do different things uh, in different places. Uh, and part of what uh, we do as children and even uh, as adults is we continue learning uh, the local culture, uh, to speak crudely, of different places. And so in the same basic naked tropical ape physiology, which, you know, some climate adaptations, of course, uh, but, but the same basic naked tropical ape physiology, we can be successful Amazonian foragers like these Ache in Paraguay. Uh, this is uh, East Africa, uh, East African pastoralists uh, making a living in um, an arid uh, and highly seasonal environment where agriculture is mainly not possible, but making use of livestock to do it. Uh, high altitude uh, Tibetan and Nepalese groups, uh, which are fascinating in part because they actually have marriage systems, uh, polyandry situations where women marry multiple men, uh, which are economically very adaptive. Uh, they make it work. Uh, and uh, uh, places where cold, high latitude, cold weather pastoralism as well, uh, like in northern Scandinavia and Siberia. Uh, we do all this, we're tropical apes, but we manage to do all these things by harnessing this slow life history and the cognitive development that's built into it um, to, to build and sustain uh, cultural adaptations to different places. And that's, that's my obsession as an anthropologist, is understanding the fit between our cognition and the pace of our aging and life history and the behavioral evolution it sets in motion. Again, to speak crudely, the cultural evolution that happens because of the life history that we have. Um, so I think about What's the killer app of the human species, right? Uh, the killer app of the starling is that it can fly, <laughs> and it's also quite clever. Uh, the killer app of the human species is that we have long form adaptation. Our form of adaptation is that we have enough time within our individual lives to acquire uh, complex productive skills that we'll use as adults. Uh, that's through prolonged development and intense investment from productive adults in our lives. Uh, when we acquire those complex skills that creates energy surpluses we can use to invest in the next generation, uh, and we can improve on these complex skills during our own lifetimes because we live a quite long time. Um, and then we have flexible prosociality, which enhances all of these things as well. We create social institutions that can be quite different in different places that help us do more than any individual could do alone. And I think of these as the hallmarks of human adaptation, and they're all exaggerated forms of general age adaptations as well. Uh, and how did we get to be uh, like this? Um, how did we get a life history that sets in motion cultural evolution to allow us to adapt? Uh, so anthropologists, uh, I'm sure I don't have to tell you in this room, have a strange fascination with foraging. <laughs> There's something about foraging. It's almost a fetish. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, I, I've been 
very sensitive to the fetishistic aspect of this. Uh, I don't think foragers are fossils, so let me say that right off uh, at the beginning. Um, foraging is worth studying uh, for many reasons, but for two key reasons that I want to say right now. And the first is that it's present every place. Foraging is not some relic of a distant past in the Pleistocene. Every human society bears subsistence foraging. It's at low frequencies in some places. I'm guessing here uh, there probably aren't a lot of people who spend too much time foraging, but chances are many of you have gathered wild mushrooms, right? So that's foraging. It counts. <laughs> in fact, the knowledge, there's very specific knowledge you need to know about which mushrooms right? uh, to gather. Uh, and the same is true in many places. Uh, there's lots of subsistence that is done this way. Uh, depending on what part of the world it is, it may be called hunting, it may be called bush meat, uh, but it's all the same activity. Foraging never drops out of our portfolio of adaptations, even if there are many individuals who don't do it. Uh, it's, it's a persistent human adaptation. It's the original economy, and it never goes away. That's a reason to study it as well. Uh, the other reason is it's a lot simpler. Uh, than studying agriculture, because often the production is in individuals or small groups, and so it's a good place to start to understand skill development and how, the, how adult skills and subadult skills lead to production. So if we want to understand the connections between cognitive development, what individuals are learning through their cognitive development, and then how that translates into energy, uh, then this is a nice focal area to start theorizing about. Uh, and that's one of the reasons. Uh, those are the good reasons, I think, to be interested in work. There are also bad reasons. We won't talk about those. Um, oh, so I also wanted to say in these photos, uh, uh, foraging is intensely socially learned. This is a cultural practice. Humans are not born knowing how to forage. Uh, and you, there are specific technologies involved. So if you're the Hadza, northern Tanzania, this is a, a young woman uh, with her mother learning to dig tubers. Uh, and these are Ache of Paraguay. There's a young man with his father learning to track animals. Uh, with these bows and arrows that they've made themselves. These things are essentially monkey harpoons, if you want to think about them that way. Uh, uh, so this is all, these are social uh, skills that we learned. Foraging is also interesting because it's embedded in technology. Foraging that we know ethnographically is only possible through complicated intergenerationally transmitted technologies, like bows and arrows, uh, but also guns and snares and dogs, which are technology. Dog is a great organic technology for hunting. And so this is in the Hadza. Uh, Hadza society is interesting for many reasons. One of those reasons is every adult knows how to make lethal nerve poison. <laughs> so uh, they make it from larva. And uh, here it is. They embed it in a, in a resin matrix, a sap matrix, and then they heat it. And then they rub it on these arrowheads that they make themselves. They, they trade for industrial nails for their agricultural neighbors. And then they pound them into these really nice uh, broadhead arrows uh, laced with lethal nerve poison. It's a polite society. <laughs> uh, so the skills to do this, right? Individuals don't discover every generation which caterpillar has poison in it, which it sequesters from particular plants. Uh, you have to be taught this information. And so Hadza foraging by foraging every place is made possible, and, and it's the amount of energy individuals can capture is only made possible by this body of cultural knowledge that evolved through the long life histories of individuals in many past generations, and has been transmitted forward. And we're interested in modeling those dynamics and how evolution could create an organism that places its bets on such a seemingly fragile system. Uh, finally, foraging is intensely cooperative. Uh, while it is usually small cooperative groups, which makes the analysis easier, uh, foraging is not some uh, human against nature uh, sort of thing. It's humans against nature. It's cooperative. And uh, and, and not just in the sense that the actual uh, harnessing of the energy here is cooperative, like these two uh, Hadza foragers. Hadza typically forage in groups of two, by the way. They have partners. Uh, but also in the sense that uh, the returns are shared quite far because it's a social insurance scheme. Right? It's the original socialism <laughs> foraging. It's so stochastic in the returns that you have to share to make it work. Right? Because everybody has a bad day or a bad week. So all of the key features of what I think of as the human killer app are present in foraging. Uh, it's a nice area to analyze and help us think about how we got to be people. Uh, so let me very quickly, before I get into the, the meat of, of what I and my colleagues are doing, um, set some constraints for you. So the borders on what we think we know about human life history and its pace and, and what 
needs to be explained. Uh, and I'll go through this fairly quickly, I apologize, but it's kind of a cartoon and that's okay. But history theory is complicated and, and you have to do a whole like 10 week course on it and we're not gonna do that. But just, just, just a few slides to give you an idea. The um, peculiar thing about humans compared to the other apes even is that our growth is delayed while our brains grow. Uh, we have very, uh, we're born, so let me talk about chimps first, look at the top. So at birth, a chimpanzee has almost half the brain it's ever going to have. Uh, maybe a little more than a third uh, of the brain it's ever going to have. Um, and its body and its brain grow at about the same rate um, until around age four, it's weaned. And it's self-sufficient. Uh, a four-year-old chimpanzee forages almost all its own food. There's almost no food sharing in chimpanzee groups. Uh, and that's how the other apes are, as far as you can tell. They're, they're very cognitive organisms, they're very flexible, they use tools spontaneously in the wild, um, but their brains grow at the same rate as their bodies, and they're born with most of their brain already. That's sort of interesting. Humans are quite different in the sense that we're born with uh, a very small fraction of our total eventual brain size. I, I can't do the math on that right away, but, uh, but like a sixth, something like that, a fifth. Um, and uh, it grows incredibly rapidly early in life, uh, actually all the way until about age seven, it grows very, very rapidly and then slows down. And, and by about age 10, we have most of the brain weight we're ever gonna get, but of course, there's still lots of brain development going on. I don't have to tell this audience, right? There's lots of brain development going on after the age of 10. Growth of the body is greatly delayed during this period because brains are expensive. Uh, how expensive? Well, let me show you. So this is from a, paper in 2014 from Chris Cazal and his colleagues where they use CT scan data to measure energy consumption in brains, uh, kids at different ages. So you can actually get nice measurements uh, to put on this. And you see that um, it's both for males and females, the main difference being the body curve, uh, right? Male growth is delayed, um, but the brain curves are the same. Uh, uh, Brains grow very rapidly right after birth, then it slows down, and there's this, this the body grows really fast to get you out of that vortex of mortality, of child mortality that happens at recruitment in humans, right? Human child mortality is very high, often higher than other apes, actually. And once they get out of that vortex, the body switches over to, the, basically, the, the body size freezes. Those of you with kids know this, right? Eventually, they stop getting heavier, and their, their heads get bigger. Uh, and this goes on uh, until about 10 years old, and then uh, the brain growth slows down, and then they start getting big and uh, hard to push around, right? <laughs> and this is peculiar. This is a derived human characteristic. The other apes don't have this. Uh, and there are still lots of unanswered questions about why it should be this way, uh, but the, the obvious speculations would be that they're setting up the brain to learn stuff. The humans are born into a cultural world, there's a lot they need to learn. They have to develop the brain and the memory capacity and the linguistic skills to get it. And they do that first. And they delay their size increase, which makes them vulnerable. So there are definitely costs to that. Um, and then, so the, the story you'll find in anthropology textbooks goes something like this. Uh, here's, here's, here's the human niche compared to apes. So what we're looking at um, is this is cons energy consumption across the lifespan taken from uh, two different foraging groups in South America. And this is energy production across the lifespan, again, taken from two different foraging groups in South America. And so early on, we're parasitic, right? We have lots of growth to be funded, and we're majorly, mainly a burden on our parents, right? And uh, uh, eventually, we start paying our own way, but it takes a long time. Uh, so it isn't until about 20 years old, in these, in these groups at least, that individuals start bringing in more energy than they cost uh, to the local group. And then there's this massive surplus being shared out to other individuals, not just their own children, but other people's children as well. Uh, and we remain productive for a very long time, well into the 60s, uh, and then a, a decline in productivity below that. Uh, this is the, the, these are chimpanzee curves, to sort of show you the uh, one guess about what chimpanzees are like. We don't actually know, by the way, what chimpanzee age specific energy production is. Uh, we don't know. Uh, these are hypothetical curves produced by assuming the body weight of a chimp and guessing how much energy you would need to maintain that body weight each age. But there's not hard data here. Uh, there's not a lot of hard data, and this is what I'm going to talk about today, on these two curves either. This is from two groups, and these are intensely smoothed curves. Now, I don't criticize this paper. This is one of my favorite papers, this 
2000 paper from Kaplan, Hill, Lancaster, and Ricardo. It's a fantastic paper, but uh, the, the statistics that go into drawing these curves will make you cringe a little bit. <laughs> massive smoothing. And so what I and my colleagues have set out to do on two fronts is to get much better cross-cultural data on these curves for humans and chimpanzees and the other apes. What I'm going to talk about today is the human part of this, uh, but we're also working on the chimpanzee side. Um, and uh, uh, there's reason to worry about uh, uh, variability uh, across human groups and across chimpanzee groups. Uh, let me just give you an example. A very recent paper out this year uh, by Brian Wood, colleagues analyzing the Ngogo chimpanzee population. Uh, uh, this is the Ngogo in, in red compared to other chimpanzee groups. This is a life table, so this is fraction of individuals surviving in a cohort at a different age. Uh, the Ngogo chimps are rocketing. Uh, it's one of the only chimpanzee groups that's growing naturally in the wild, uh, really doing really, really well. And here's what I love. When compared to the human foraging populations, uh, they, have, they overlap. Uh, and in fact, they have way lower uh, infant mortality than, than ethnographically known contemporary horticultural and foraging groups of humans. Uh, the variability in chimpanzees is, is bigger than we ever thought it was. There's a good chance that the variability in human life history and production curves is greater than we think it is. So we need the data to do it. So this part of the reason uh, 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 to worry about variability and not be satisfied with just examples, uh, uh, the still stereotype examples. The goal is to get better measurements so we can feed them into evolutionary models. I'm not going to talk through this graph in detail, it's just to say that uh, people are now working on uh, optimality-based evolutionary models of life history and brain growth. Uh, here's a recent paper, 2017, by Mauricio gonzalez Barrero, who's at St. Andrews right now, uh, a brilliant young theoretician uh, who has this optimal control model of human life history where you get the evolution uh, of growth of the brain and the body and the skill that results, oh, and reproduction is kind of important, uh, at different ages. And this is an optimal control solution. Without going into the details, what Mauricio needs to really test this model are estimates of age-specific skill. And we don't have good estimates of that. So these measurements I'll show you today are meant to be plugged into models of this kind. They will obviously then tell us that the models are wrong, <laughs> and then we will, the wheel of time will go on. Okay, that's the setup. Uh, um, so let me try to summarize that setup, what I call the borderlands of knowledge. And like with all borderlands, we may discover that there's not really a border there. Uh, so there was an illusion. Uh, that's okay. Uh, so humans, we grow very slow, uh, especially for uh, an animal our size. We delay growth for a long time. But during that time, our brains are growing very fast. There are open questions about what we're doing with those brains, um, uh, what we're learning. Um, I think uh, there's good reason to think we're learning adult skills that will let us generate surpluses that pay for the next generation, uh, lower our survival as adults so that we can enjoy all the skills we've learned, we can live long enough to make to pay for the investment in our childhood. Um, in order to test such models and understand how such a life history could ever arise, we need to understand how big the surplus is in different places. Is every place like the Ache, that, that graph I showed you before, uh, or not? Um, the speed, the pace of skill gain compared to the pace of development of the brain is very interesting for testing detailed models. Um, and the variability itself is interesting because uh, some ecologies are hard, some are easy. Uh, in some ecologies, these things will be buffered with social insurance schemes and so on. Uh, individual variation is equally interesting because if some individuals are twice as productive at the same age as others, that drastically changes the incentives for sharing. Uh, so understanding the social economy depends upon getting measurements of these things as well. Okay, so this is the project I want to talk to you about today. This is still ongoing. Uh, we have a, a draft manuscript, uh, but we're, now we're in the phase of worrying again about everything we've done. <laughs> uh, but soon this will all be out, including all the data and code. Uh, here are all the co-authors. Uh, you think about this is a big project, um, uh, mainly uh, headed by uh, myself and my colleague Dr. Jeremy Coster, who's at the University of Cincinnati. Jeremy works in Nicaragua with the Native American foragers. Um, and what I want to say about this project is that most of the effort is data collection. Almost all of our colleagues here spend time in the field following individuals and weighing the things they bring back, like this delicious piece of meat uh, right here. And that's the bulk of the effort, and really is what makes all this possible. Fieldwork is hard, it's difficult, it's essential. It's not the glamorous part of doing this work, uh, 
but without this, you can't learn what's going on. Then there's data processing. This is all Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy uh, uh, is one of the few uh, uh, forager uh, researchers who everybody likes, <laughs> and so everybody will give him their data. And uh, he writes to all these people, and they're like, oh yeah, I remember we had a great time at that workshop. And he's like, by the way, can I have your data? <laughs> and so uh, people send him data in, as you can imagine, many different fantastic formats. Sometimes on floppy disk. <laughs> right? It's just, he once received an Excel spreadsheet that had inside of it a screenshot of an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> and so Jeremy is a very capable data scientist in addition to being a good anthropologist, and he has spent lots of many, many frustrating hours turning these data into something we can analyze. So really, Jeremy's done way more work than I have uh, on this. I want to be clear about that. And then this is what I've done <laughs> this last little green sliver that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and really, the server has done most of the work there. Uh, so, what have we done? Well, uh, we have tried to collect as many data sets as we know, as many samples where there are foraging returns for individuals, where we can associate um, uh, a package, what we call a harvest, a package of meat. Uh, so uh, this is not plant-based foraging, unfortunately, because there just isn't a big literature on that. But uh, meat-based foraging, where we can associate the kilograms of meat that were brought in with a labor input, that is how long it took to produce it, and with an individual with a known age. Now, I'll talk about what known means later. <laughs> we all know asking someone's age in the field is not always an easy thing. Um, and it turns out there is a lot of stuff like this. It isn't always anthropology. Some of it's ecology researchers interested in bush meat uh, because they want to know the impact of humans on the local ecology. And so they have fantastic quantitative data sets from communities about how, how much individuals are harvesting uh, from wildlife. And so uh, Jeremy has, has so far been able to get 39 data sets. We're anticipating a few more rolling in, actually. So you want to think about this project as constantly rolling in the future. And if we can get new studies going, um, inspired by this project, we'll roll them into the same model and just keep updating it as we go. Um, you'll notice that the distribution is uh, very concentrated in the tropics. Uh, we've got a few high latitude sites. I would love to have more, so if anybody wants to go work in high latitude, uh, let me know. I might be able to throw some funding your way. These latitudes up high, people don't like them very much, but <laughs> that's not your idea of vacation. <laughs> but it's, it's those are the people who live up there are, are intensely interesting. Okay, um, so these data sets, the best ones, are incredible because you get repeat samples on the same foragers across different ages, and these are the data that give you the best information about changes in productive skill across the lifespan. Uh, so, to give you an example, this is from uh, Kim Hill and Keith Kintai, uh, their work on, on summarizing the Ache data set. This is a great paper describing 20 years of data. Uh, more than 20 years of data now on the Ache of Paraguay. Here are the same individuals in, in 1978 when the study began. Uh, they were young. Uh, and in, pictures taken in 2009. Um, and there are foraging records over, you know, it's not continuous. It's not that they've been back every year. Uh, but there are hundreds of foraging records from these two individuals spanning the development of their adult productivity. Really incredible. Most of the samples aren't this good. Uh, most of the samples are shorter time periods, more cross-sectional. Uh, fewer e from the same individuals, uh, so some statistical care is needed uh, to handle this, um, and that's that's what my job comes <laughs> in. I can have some value on this. Um, so what's the goal? Uh, we're interested crudely. Uh, does the pattern that's in the textbooks hold? How much variation is there across culture? And by the pattern, I mean uh, peak productivity is uh, arrives after physical maturity. Individuals reach their peak after, long after 18. Um, and uh, the other question is, and, and I should also say, individuals remain productive quite late. All right? It isn't that they're only productive in their 30s. They remain productive into their 60s. Um, there's a question about how much variability there is. And also, I think of this as uh, being a quant. I'm interested in always pushing the statistical boundaries of what we think we can do. And I would like to, uh, I envision a future where we have many long-term studies going on with large amounts of data coming in, and we want to have models of human life history to make use of all these data with all of their imperfections, because fieldwork is always going to be a mess. And so uh, part of this project, the attraction of this project to me, is working on that statistical frontier and trying to develop a model which is diligent about uh, the imperfections of the data, doesn't hide any of those imperfections, and tries to make best use of the information. And I'm going to tell you about what that means in a second. Um, so what's the sample we have? 39 sites so far, 
1,821 unique individuals with unique ID numbers associated with different returns. 21,160 trips. Uh, this is a trip is associated with a labor input right, per person. Um, and that's associated with slightly more harvest because some of these trips are pairs of individuals who go out and then kind of split. They spend, they come back together, but they kind of, they bring back, they, they bag different game and then they come back together. But it's the same trip uh, in a sense. It's semi cooperative uh, in a sense. And I say uncountable headaches. I'm not sure what the count is. But <laughs> you can imagine cleaning the data here is very difficult and, and uh, uh, lots of stuff goes on. Okay. What if we fit to these data? This is a case where uh, we fit the model that was in our grant proposal. Um, I think this is a pre-registered model. Uh, and I want to say this is that the temptation here is um, to try different models until you get something that fits well, and we didn't do that. Uh, so there will be things about these models which I can endlessly criticize, but at least I can say we did what was in the grant proposal. And it's not bad, so it's, it's, there are bad things about it, but it's not bad. Um, the idea was we wanted to have some function which wasn't, well, basically wasn't a polynomial. Early on when Jeremy approached me with this project, he said, well, we can fit like a, a, a cubic polynomial. I was like, no, I refuse on religious grounds to fit a polynomial. <laughs> Absolutely refuse. And so we, we went into the life history literature and tried to find something that we thought could fit the data. And what we ended, we wanted something that would be able to take on a range of shapes where there's an initial rapid increase and then there's a peak somewhere. Um, and we wanted it to have as few parameters as possible. And what we ended up with is something that's called the, the von Berlin peak growth law, uh, originally used in fish life history. Uh, so now this is called this the people as fish model, but this is just the simplest life history model that you can get. And all it asserts is that. There are a bunch of processes which create uh, a decelerating increase, in this case in skill. Um, and then there are processes of senescence, uh, which create decline in age. Uh, and it turns out if you multiply those things together, you get a peak curve like this. Uh, and so with three parameters, um, an increase parameter, which we're going to call K, think of that as knowledge or something like that, uh, a, a senescence parameter, which I call M for mortality, and then an allometry parameter B, which scales the importance of the knowledge component, uh, you can get a bunch of different curves here. And so three parameters, uh, this is very constrained compared to a cubic polynomial, uh, but it has some theory behind it, and the parameters have some meaning, uh, which I think is nice for interpretation. Uh, not to say this is the right model or the perfect model, but it was the one that was in our grant proposal, so I can honestly say we tied our hands here and did it. Uh, this is a new experience for me. It feels good. Because you don't feel like you have to defend it. <laughs> it's just like, this is what I did. There are things about it which didn't work out. We can learn from those. Okay. Um, this is to show it can take on a lot of different shapes. Uh, so the, the resulting skill functions across age don't even necessarily have to have peaks. Uh, you can get lots of things from variable increase rates combined with variable decline rates. So we're going to fit these parameters for every individual in the sample. Uh, to predict the returns, though, skill doesn't manifest as a peccary, right? A, a, we don't have peccary that is, and we have kilograms uh, of meat. It, it's, instead, you need a production function. And in this case, again, uh, the model that was in our grant proposal, we just go to economics textbooks and pull out the most basic textbook production model uh, called the Cobb-Douglas model. Um, Cobb-Douglas is basically just the log linear production model. It assumes that everything is synergistic, so that production is proportional to the skill of an individual raised to some exponent called an elasticity. Uh, this is a coefficient, because if you log this whole thing, this is a log linear model, right? You've got the coefficient A times log skill. Uh, so that's why it's called a log linear model. And think of the elasticity as how much skill matters for production. Uh, and then the labor. So the more units of labor, the more skill matters. The more skill matters, the more the labor matters. That's why it's a synergy model. Uh, and then technology matters. What's technology? Some of these trips have guns, some of them have dogs. Those are the two main forms of technology. There are also assistants, uh, which is another a third form of technology. Assistant means your son who's not actually foraging but is carrying things for you. And that matters because it means you can bring more back. Uh, when your son is schlepping the deer around, <laughs> right? Uh, that means they can bring back twice as much. Uh, so those technology terms go in here, and there's US history for that. Uh, so I say, if you want to think what's the strong assumption, here, the strong assumption is that everything is synergistic. That's a strong assumption. That's probably not quite right, but it, 
that's the strong assumption. And so the problem done was, again, it could create a lot of different things. The thing about this data to keep in mind is you can have different elasticities for skill and labor and tech uh, for different components of production. Notably, uh, about 60% of all of the foraging records in this data are total failures. They're zeros. Because most of the trips fail. This is the thing about foraging. It's true. But when they get something, it could be quite large. So it's, this is a highly zero inflated data set. So to model it, we have to have just a, a, a production function for whether you get anything at all. Uh, and then we have to have a production function for harvest size. And these two things multiply to provide expected returns. And so expected returns can vary by skill, and skill can relate differentially to success and harvest. Um, and then there can be variation due to the cooperative group size and other things as well that go into the technology. You with me? At least a little bit? You just need a cartoon understanding of this. Uh, okay. So, what's the model? Uh, this is a simple model. It is. <laughs> uh, this isn't some complicated Bayesian neural network deep learning thing, right? Uh, this, this is a pretty simple model. Basically, I just told you the whole model. Every individual has two parameters which describe their life history. There's a third kilometer parameter which is specific to a group, that B parameter. And then there are the elasticities on the skills uh, for each group. They're, those aren't unique to people. And so at each site, uh, the model isn't too complicated. It's a pretty simple hierarchical model. The only thing that makes it look fancy is there's no polynomials. Uh, the skill function is that weird thing of exponents. So that's the only part that looks fancy, and it's actually simpler than a traditional polynomial model. Um, so this is just something you could do in LMP4, pretty much. Uh, maybe not, <laughs> but almost. You could almost do it in LMP4. And, uh, but we've got a bunch of sites. Um, and we want to pool within sites and across sites. Uh, and so this is uh, what makes the model challenging to fit is that there's a hierarchical structure. The model gets replicated across individuals within sites and then across sites. And this generates a lot of replicated parameter vectors that we have to deal with. So there's pooling within each site, which is to say there's a fictional average forager within each site, and we estimate the variances around that, and that lets us do pooling. Uh, because why do we need to do this? Those of you who read some of my books, you know the sermon. Uh, if you have sampling and balance across individuals, you need to deal with that in a rational way, and pooling is a, is a good, honest way to do it, uh, to avoid overfitting. Uh, so we know way more about some foragers than others because they appear in the data set more. That's the basic problem. Uh, so we do pooling with insights, and we let each site have its own sort of ideal type forager and its own variances. So because in some sites, uh, the differences in productivity across foragers could be massive, and other sites it could be small. Right? Technology, for example, we suspect that going into this has a way of flattening skill differences, making them matter less. So the model needs to be able to fit that. And then we pool across sites at a second level of pooling. So this is what I call a true hierarchical model. It's not that this is cross classified, it's that there are unique variance components or hyperparameters within each site, and then those hyperparameters are pooled at a higher level across sites. And so we get, we get parameters, I'll introduce you to later, which you can think of as kind of the poor society. Right? This is the, the average human society uh, in the sample, at least. It's a statistical fiction, but it's a focus of inference, in a sense, to say what the average skill function is across all of these sites. You with me? In a cartoon way, at least? Yeah? Um, so uh, all this emerges just from what I call duty, <laughs> uh, trying to be honest to the data structure and do the pooling right, uh, imposes on this, this model design. Uh, there are other issues of duty and diligence uh, as well in this, and uh, uh, these are really common to all kinds of studies, I think, but especially the anthropology data, is we often have missing data. Uh, so for example, for some of the trips, we don't know the labor input because somebody didn't record it. It happens, right? It's not like a lab experiment where you don't expect any missing values. Uh, anthropology is not like that. Uh, you have lots of missing values. You also have measurement error. Uh, well, I should also say technology. Sometimes we don't know if there was a dog present, right? Because it wasn't recorded. There could have been a dog there. <laughs> uh, dogs make a big difference. They have a really huge effect on returns. So, and yet, measurement error, I mentioned age. People will tell you your age in these contexts, and you don't know whether you should believe it or not, right? Calendar age is a strange construct. And uh, in fact, it's not even clear that calendar age is the thing we care about. 
uh, but I'm not going to talk about that too much today. Um, so we don't always believe the age stuff. Uh, we have to deal with error issues with age. So uh, now, normally, all of us have have problems like this in many observational data sets. Sociologists have these problems as well as anthropologists. And we know we're supposed to care about these things and worry about them, but it's so hard uh, to deal with these problems that we're just like, yeah, we'll drop these cases. Yeah, let's take the midpoint page or something like that. And I've done that plenty. Uh, I admit all my sins before all of you today. Um, so with this project, though, as I said, we're trying to push the frontier, and so we decided we would do the due diligence on these, and we would try to work as hard on these inconvenient things uh, that make us sleep on our keyboards uh, as much as we worked on the fun parts. Um, and so additional complexity in the modeling comes about with trying to solve these problems. And statisticians have developed solutions to these problems uh, in the 20th century, call these the 20th century solutions to these problems. Um, and now we have the computational power of the desktop to actually execute them. And the solutions are imputation, meaning for things like missing data of labor, we can define statistical assumptions on the distribution of labor, we can estimate the shape of that distribution from the observed cases, and then we can impute statistically what the labor would be for the cases where it wasn't observed, with full uncertainty. Right? And this is better than dropping cases. But let's just say all the assumptions that let you drop cases with missing values are the same ones that let you do this, uh, which is a nice conservative type of statement. Uh, and then marginalization, which is related, which is a case where we don't actually impute the value, but we average over our lack of knowledge. Uh, but it's, it's statistically speaking, it's very similar, but it's computationally very efficient. Uh, so we, we employ both of these techniques here to deal with these problems where we have uh, uh, bins on age and we estimate error, uh, and then uh, we have unknown labor inputs and unknown presence of dogs. It could have been a dog. So, uh, okay, the end result is that we end up with a very large model. Uh, with 27,417 parameters. Uh, so you can imagine this discussion, <laughs> right? Uh, this is a bother. It's a huge bother. And it's a huge bother because most of the statistical techniques that all of us learn in our introductory stats classes are premised on the notion that we're going to use optimization to fit the models of the data. And optimization does not work in high dimensions. It, it doesn't work because it's hard, because it would take too long. It doesn't work because the mode is irrelevant. High dimensions. Uh, I don't have time to talk about this over coffee with some of you later. But this is one of the coolest and most fascinating things about statistics, I think. This is thing called concentration of measure. That in high dimensions, the probability mass can be unreasonably far from the most likely combination of parameter values. And so it's, it's fascinating. Again, it's just a fact. <laughs> it's well known in statistics, it's called concentration of measure. What do you do then? Well, you can't optimize. You have to do something else. And this is why Markov changes. It's gotten so popular. Uh, and by the way, 27,000 isn't where this starts. This starts at about 100. This is when you really need to worry about it. Long before 27,000. So, um, and again, this is about pushing the frontier. And so everybody talks about big data, right? Uh, we're in the big data world now. Everybody likes big data. I like big data too. We do too. Much data. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, but the thing about big data is it induces trade offs. And so often as our so when we have very little data, nobody thinks they can fit a complicated model to it, right? We, we fit low-dimensional models when we have small samples because that's all we have the ambition to do. We know better than we think we do before. As sample size increases, our ambitions increase. Right? And we, we start to fit the models we like. And then as data gets big, we just have to simple, simplify the models because we want to publish the paper eventually. Right? Eventually, we're going to have a review, and the paper needs to be out. We can't say it's still running. The committee doesn't like that answer. So, uh, uh, well, part of what we're trying to do in, in my department is bend this curve and try to make fewer sacrifices and marry big data to big models. And that's part of this push as well. And there are serious computational challenges here, but they're being solved. Um, and so how are they being solved? Most notably uh, by uh, algorithms like Hamilton and Monte Carlo. Um, the STAN library uh, makes this practical, given uh, some initial learning curve to do. Um, so skipping over the details, we've agonized a lot over getting this work. We fake data from simulations, uh, and then we get them all working on that first and before we ever put the real data in. It, the simulation and validation part took a long time, about a month and a half, before we actually got any model to run over simulated data correctly. Um, but then when we put in the real data, it worked right off. 
It was very satisfying. We took two days off of work. <laughs> it was very nice. Um, so let me tell you now, uh, and I'll go quickly, uh, what happens now. I can tell you, after all of that statistical effort, the general patterns we see in these data, what the sources of variation are that we see, and then mainly that for me this is an exercise in thinking about what needs to be done to do better. There's a, there are some strong claims we can make in these data, and but many strong claims just simply cannot be made in these data. But that tells us what we would need uh, going forward in terms of better data sets. So let me walk you through for a single society, uh, the Acheya Parkway, this is number 15, uh, uh, what we get out of this. So this is looking at individual forager skill functions, just as this posterior means. There's uncertainty around each of these lines, uh, uh, but this is for each line is a person. Um, what you're looking at up here, this is the number of people. There are 147 individuals in the sample and 14,000 trips. And the orange range is the range of ages for which we actually have observations. So no one in the Ache is foraging before age, I don't know what that is, 15? Uh, just about 12, something like that. And there's no one who is foraging after like, 77 or so. Uh, or so. Uh, the dashed line, vertical dashed line, is the peak of the average forager when the average forager peaks when they reach their crest. And that's at 38. Right? So, any of you coming up on 38, congratulations, you have something to look forward to. Any of you who passed it, I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> now, this varies, as you're going to see. Uh, uh, but it's quite late compared to the age of physical maturity. Right? Um, then this translates into production functions. Uh, production is nearly always more variable uh, than in skill functions because uh, the elasticities can magnify the differences in production. In a sense, there can be skill thresholds in the production function for actually getting something. And so small differences in skill can translate into big differences in production, especially late in life. So looking at the Ache, this is the probability of getting anything um, across the lifespan. You see it's much more variable than the analog skill estimates. Very little variation provided you've gotten something in how big it's going to be. Uh, and that's because of the ecology. This is South America, everything's small. Right? This is Africa, it would be a little different, because occasionally you get a giraffe. Right? Giraffe, a little different. Right? Pecorino, not so different. Right? Uh, finally, uh, if you multiply these two things together, you get expected returns in each age. And here I've, I've superimposed the average um, empirical uh, returns at each unique age over it to show you that this fits the data remarkably well for a three parameter model. I felt like it was okay. Now it's not perfect. There are things that I can I can instantly criticize about this. So just give you an idea how it goes. Uh, these two points, by the way, are single individuals. Uh, out here. Okay, here's the whole sample. Um, I don't expect we're not going to go through this. Uh, I'm sure you have other things you want to do today. Um, <laughs> Uh, just at a, at a glance, what I want you to see is that the peak is after physical maturity everywhere, uh, but at the same time, it's often quite flat. There's, there's not a lot that's very special about the peak. Um, individuals reach 80, in excess of 80% of their maximum production uh, quite early, right, by age 20, and they, re they maintain it for quite a long time, uh, in some places uh, well into their late years. So the best foragers in the AJ in particular uh, can stay uh, nearly at maximum until they stop. Uh, it's really incredible. Uh, you'll notice some of these some of these societies like this one, they're clustered tightly together. That's an artifact of how hard it is to visualize Bayesian, Bayesian estimates. Uh, what, the model doesn't think they're all the same. The model doesn't know how different they are. So these are posterior means and it lumps them together. So let, let me show you just very quickly. If we instead sample from the posterior distribution at each of these sites some random fictional hunters, you can see that then they get more scattered. The model expects a lot of variation across individuals. In each group, uh, according to the, the posterior fit, there are individuals who are twice as productive at any given age as other individuals. And that matters a lot from the anthropological perspective because it sets up sharing economies. It sets up cases where some individuals are putting in a lot more than other individuals, and they may just start to think about moving. <laughs> That's a consequence of that, right? Uh, and, and how human society solve those problems of unequal investments is a very important um, finally, last last crazy slide like this. Uh, this is the production version, just to show you that uh, the variation often goes up. So the Ache have uh, a much narrower range of variation in skill than they do in returns, because there are threshold effects. You have to be sufficiently skilled to bring something back, uh, is, is what's going on there. Uh, 
Uh, okay, let me show you the Ur Society, as I call it. It's sort of at the top level of pooling, there's this fictional society we can sample foragers from. Uh, let me show you what that is. Uh, so this is a statistical fiction, but inside the model, this exists as a way to do the pooling. It's the center of statistical gravity. It's the average society. There's a lot of uncertainty about this average. So what I've drawn here in the black line, a little bit camouflaged, the black line is the posterior mean average society skill function. And then the, these are samples from around that mean to show you the uncertainty about it. Um, and what we can say is uh, across societies, the average peaks at 31, which is a long time after peak physical maturity. So, uh, uh, Men uh, and women have peak uh, strength uh, in their 20s, uh, typically in their early 20s. Uh, and, and so this is a good time after that. And of course, you can start reproducing right before this. So it's interesting why an animal would have a life history where it makes investments in skill after it starts reproducing. It's hard to make a life history model where that makes any sense, uh, actually. You should, well, life history model says you should delay reproducing until you've made all your skill investments, and then you should spin them. Right? So this is why I think sometimes students delay childbirth until they finish their PhDs. <laughs> right? That makes sense from a life history perspective. It doesn't make as much sense from other perspectives. Right? Uh, but uh, it makes sense from a life history perspective. Um, if we look at what happens in an 18-year-old taking 18 as physical maturity, which does some violence to the facts actually, because uh, that varies across societies quite a lot, um, an 18-year-old has 86% of maximum skill, and has about the same skill as a 55 year old, which is a nice way to think about it. So, when you meet an 18 year old fellow there, it's still this 55 year old. <laughs> Make them feel good about this. Uh, so, this is the point to say that the increase is pretty rapid, um, and they're not unskilled at physical maturity, but then there are increases, and the decline is a lot slower than the increase. There are more ties to that investment. I, I read this as the general pattern that we have from the other studies is upheld. There's good inference that. Uh, the other groups fit the general pattern, despite the fact that there's massive ecological variation across these data sets. Uh, so this is just, uh, I won't read through this, this is just the word slide to say what I just said uh, before. Uh, let me jump straight to the bottom of this list. Uh, why do we care about this again? I've said this before, we care about this because the pace of energy supply and demand feeds into these life history models. It tells us how many dependents can be supported at each age, uh, how much sharing is needed across individuals to buffer uh, uncertainty in production, uh, uh, how much uh, energy supply is needed just to pay for your own energetic dependence, given activity levels. All those things go into figuring out how we have the pace that we do, and then feeds into cognitive development, and so on. How do we pay for our brains? How do we pay for our brains through adult production? So knowing how much adult production is being done tells us how expensive brains can get. Right? I think this is if, uh, an interesting uh, paradoxical thing for humans, of course, because all of these curves we've estimated are conditional on the existence of technologies and social institutions that give rise to cultural evolution, which only exist because the brains exist. Uh, so there's the feedbacks are really tantalizing. Uh, I can't speak to those with these data, but I just want to remind you that they're there. Uh, finally, uh, individuals vary quite a lot. The model outputs uncertainties at the individual level. Here's forager 1,329 from group 9, just to show most of the data for this individual is from young years because they're still young, this is still a young man. Uh, the model predicts uh, what they might do in old age, uh, but it's quite uncertain given the, the estimates from the model. Does this make sense? Uh, here's an individual who we have his whole lifespan, so the model is quite confident about what the skill function is for that individual across life. This is plotted for failures, by the way, probably failures, which is why it's important. Um, so there are parameters in the model for variation across individuals. So we can look at the look at it at that level. So within sites, um, now this is among sites. So across sites, what explains variation in the life history parameters? Most of the variation across sites. This is like saying, what's there's variation in the average forager in different samples. What explains that variation? More of it is due to rates of increase than rates of decline. So to say, if you were trying to uh, say what makes different groups different, it's some of them take off faster than others. Uh, I interpret this at least uh, very loosely as, as fitting with the idea that there's a common socializing environment in the different groups that everybody flows into, and then affects rates of increase. And, but those are different social ecologies in different places that are affected. Uh, but we don't know. I mean, these, this is just what we got. Uh, 
At the individual variation level, it, this relationship flips. So now we, within each group, there are parameters for differences between individuals. Uh, and in this case, within each group, individuals are different from one another more because of rates of decline. Some of them decline faster than others than because of rates of gain. Uh, rates of gain do matter. It's not that they're inconsequential. It's just that it's more than some individuals senesce faster. And so uh, uh, their life history uh, uh, paths, their skill functions are different. And they end up being less productive over their lifespan as a consequence. Uh, so we don't know why it should be this way, but this helps, this is a, a, a kind of borderland that helps us constrain our theorizing going forward. Uh, okay, thank you for uh, uh, listening to all this. Uh, I swear I'll finish the talk in a moment. Uh, <laughs> so this is just to summarize the variation thing again. Again, I'm going to jump to the italics to say that uh, we care about individual differences because they structure the charity in life. It's not that they're just ephemeral things, they're not error. Uh, they're things that people have to strategize around, to plan around. We care about individual differences because they affect the kinds of societies that are possible and functional. Uh, so estimating the size of those differences is important. Uh, and, and the site differences uh, uh, seem to be mainly about early life, rates of increase, and not about late life. Uh, that constrains our theorizing again to think about what it is, about how socialization works, or when there are effects. Uh, and I think this is paradoxical. I thought when we were going into this that uh, uh, late life is when things can vary. Or, or, or early life is so important in the cognitive development literature, right? So all the differences between individuals should have to do with things that happen early on. But that's not what we get with insights here. We get the opposite effect. That everybody gets the same basic calculus, is what these models say. But then late life, some individuals get injured. And we climb. Uh, uh, with better data, this might not hold up. I don't know, but that's what we found. Okay, last slide. Uh, we confirmed the general patterns that are in the textbooks, gay textbooks. They're right occasionally. Uh, the peak is after maturity, uh, and we're productive long after reproduction. Uh, substantial individual differences. Uh, delayed growth does pay. Uh, but note this is conditional on cultural evolution. This is a story about maintenance of being humans. It's not how you get to be humans from an able life history. Because to, to start, you don't have all the cultural institutions that pose errors to start. Uh, so it's a very different problem. Right? Uh, just keep that in mind. I've got no solution to the origins problem. Just to say, this is about maintenance. Uh, uh, so, it's, again, the value, all these estimates feed into specific evolutionary models about how humans pay for humans, and, and how knowledge fits into productivity and, is, and builds across generations. Um, what's really needed, of course, are new long-term studies and the commitment from our scientific institutions in supporting such long-term studies, which may not have the glam value uh, to be in nature. Anyway, thank you for your time. I hope this is interesting.